So with that, I would like to welcome everyone. My name is Rebecca Lowe. I'm the Adult Program Coordinator at the Lewis Public Library, and thank you for joining us this evening. And welcome to our series, Science and Society, Making Sense of the World Around Us. This lecture series is co-organized and moderated by Fred Dilla, Executive Director Emeritus of the American Institute of uh, Physics and author of Scientific Journeys. Linda Dilla, former public information officer at the Jefferson Laboratory and the U.S. Department of Energy, and Colin Norman, the former news editor at Science. So with that, I would like to turn the floor over to Fred. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. It's a pleasure to be here introducing our speaker tonight, Professor Nicholas Money. Some of you may Remember Professor Money? He was last here live in Lewis for the 218 History Book Festival, where he gave a really interesting and wonderful talk on another organism, the rise of yeast, very important uh, organism you'll hear more about from Professor uh, Money. Money today. Uh, as Rebecca mentioned he has a new book called Molds, Mushrooms, and Medicines, and he's going to tell us about these wonderful creatures, their evolution, their history of use, their history of misuse, and uh, those of you who may remember his 218 talk, he tells his stories with a large dose of humor, and it amuses you and educates you along the way. And after reading his latest book, uh, I felt good about the first time about fungi, and I hope hope you will too. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Nicholas Money, who is a professor of biology at Miami University. And thank you for joining us tonight, Nick. Hey, um, can you hear me? We good? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I actually wish I was there. I do wish I was there in person. We've got a uh, a, a horrible storm barreling towards us in Oxford, Ohio. We're, we're just north of um, Cincinnati. And so anyway, hopefully the screen won't go blank in half an hour, but I can already hear the thunder. But so molds, mushrooms, and medicines. So when I began work on this book a couple of years ago, I called upon John Milton's muse as I began this exploration of the human relationship with the fungi. And the book opens with an amended version of some of the opening lines from Paradise Lost, so the greatest poem written in the English language. And so it goes. Sing, heavenly muse, what in them is dark, illumine, what is low, raise and support, that to the height of this great argument I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of mushrooms to men. So there's no harm aiming high when you start writing a book. This is my book about the, it's my story or my version of the story of the human fungus symbiosis near and far from the mycobiome, which is the fungal component of the microbiome that reaches all the way from the surface of the body to the interior of the digestive system. And then also looking outwards at the symbiosis beyond the body to the ways that we use fungi as foods and medicines, the yin and yang of their poisons and psychotropic compounds, and all the way in the last chapter to the ecological activities of the fungi that make life on the surface of earth possible for us. So with the exception, I've written um, a good deal about the fungi, but with the exception of the aforementioned 2018 book, The Rise of Yeast, um, my writings on the fungi have been, they've delved into the biology of my favorite organisms and have really ignored Homo sapiens. And now with so much interest in human mycology, I wanted in this book to explain what the science says about our very fungal nature and also to clarify a few topics that I think have been strung out into nonsense by popular commentators on mycology. 
So at the age of 62, I'd been studying the fungi for 40 years. And it was time or so I thought in my solipsistic fashion to share some of the mycological wisdom that I've acquired, absorbed during this immense period of time. So what I'm going to do here is to just give you some snippets. Oh, come on, you can do it. You can do it. My slides are being very naughty. I'll do it here. There we go. I should have had this up when I when I uh, misquoted John Milton, but you can look on the first page of the, the narrative. I'm going to talk about mushrooms here. I'm also going to talk about fungi that grow in the form of microscopic yeasts and also fungi that grow on the human body and with which we interact in the form of these colonies of filamentous cells or hyphae. 10 chapters. There's 10 chapters in the book, and I'm just going to give you the uh, the, the term on, the, uh, on each of these slides here that refers to those chapters. And I'm just going to give you a vignette, I suppose, some story from a story from each of those chapters to just introduce the topic topics that I cover, give you an give you an idea of the breadth of coverage, and hopefully finish with plenty of time for some questions. Interacting. So we interact, humans interact with fungi from the womb to the tomb. When I used to talk about fungal spores and toxic black mold, which I still do in legal settings as, a, as an expert witness. I used to say that we inhale fungal spores from first breath to last gasp. But in researching this book, it was clear that our relationship with the fungi extends, that the bookends are extended. We're interacting with fungi in the womb and our corpses are interacting with fungi in the tomb. So talking about fungi in the womb, we know that we're we are um, that we're establishing an early relationship with the fungi from analysis of the meconium, which is the here we go from the womb to the tomb. So analysis of the meconium, which is the first tarry deposit from the from the gut after we're born, we find traces of of fungal DNA, uh, mostly yeast DNA in that deposit. So clearly we're, we're actually absorbing fungi or, 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 or particles, fungal particles in the womb. We're probably doing this by taking sips of amniotic fluid. And we knew that, know that the fetus begins swallowing quite early in development. Fungi must be present in that location because we're finding that in that, uh, in that meconium um, after we're, we're born. So this is a long relationship that then extends through life into the tomb where there are some fungi that are very important in decomposing the uh, human tissues, tough human tissues like hair and bone in particular. Touching, chapter two. So in this chapter, I'm looking at our interactions with fungi on the skin. And this picture shows probably the first piece of, of, of bespoke well, human footwear that was found in an Armenian cave. And so we've been wearing shoes of varying uh, quality for a long period of time. And it seems that the fungi that cause athletes foot are encouraged by wearing shoes. And the evidence is that the, that the center of biological diversity for the fungi that cause athletes foot is Africa just like us. So as we migrated to cooler climates and we began wearing shoes, the effect of this was actually to transform a, a harmless commensal, something that was growing on the human skin, into something that it could actually begin really invading um, our skin tissues and causing the, the symptoms of athlete's foot. So there's a, there's a downside to wearing shoes. And this is just one example of the way that we've changed the relationship between fungi and the human body during human history. Here we go, trichophyton, the athlete's foot fungus. 
Fungi grow all over the surface of the body, and they're found in particularly large numbers on the scalp, um, where up to a million yeasts can grow in the area in the area of a postage stamp. And they're they're living on the sebum, the fatty secretions on the the scalp. Um, in these these immense numbers, we've got five million hair follicles. And there's a fungus called the, the called Malassezia that that is um, implicated in in dandruff, and so I want to show you this as an example of a way in which we're also changing our relationship with fungi on the body. America's number one dandruff shampoo is in fact the world's best selling shampoo, Head and Shoulders. Um, so Procter and Gamble is the biggest employer of the students from my university. P and G's based in Cincinnati, and this is one of our great products. Then Head and Shoulders shampoo that contains an antifungal agent that actually is effective against dandruff by stalling the growth of that fungus. So millions, tens of millions of of, of people are using this every day as a shampoo in the shower. And this has a profound effect upon the fung fungi that are growing on the scalp. It's also ending up in groundwater. The compound is actually listed there and it's shown there on the, the front of the bottle, Perithion zinc. And we're thoughtlessly transforming the fungi that are growing on the body through this activity. There is no evidence for a downside here, but it does make me wonder, what are we doing here? We pay a lot of attention now to antibacterial compounds, antibiotics. Very little attention has been paid to the antifungal agents that we're discharging into the environment. In, an agri in agricultural settings, we use very powerful antifungal agents that are related to the antifungal agents that are used to control serious infections, serious human infections. We're using those as, as, as fungicides in, 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 in cereal agriculture in, in vast quantities that we're spreading on crops. These are also ending up in groundwater. And in the book, I wonder whether this kind of practice might be part of the story of the rise of some fungal infections that are caused by fungi that appear to be resistant to the available um, standard antifungal drugs that are used in a hospital setting. So you may have heard of Candida auris, which appears to rebuff most of the available treatments. There have been some ideas put forward that this, the growth of this or the evolution, the microevolution of this fungus might be related to climate change. But I'm far more interested in the way that maybe we've we've changed some of these fungi, including Canada auris, by this whole scale use of antifungal agents in in nature. So food for thought. Chapter three on breathing, which for which there's a personal connection here. Fungal uh, fungal spores are a, an important cause of asthma. And they've been related to um, one of the dominant causes of childhood asthma, which is interesting because if you look at textbooks of respiratory medicine and immunology, fungi are rarely mentioned. We often look at hay fever and looking at plant pollen, um, pet dander, um, uh, dust mites and so forth. But the fungi are really, really important. And they probably established my personal relationship with fungi very early in life. I'm just going to give you a very brief reading from the third chapter. I'm an asthmatic, particularly I was an asthmatic as a child. Air seems to coagulate during an asthma attack with each inhalation un urgently demanding conscious attention. Suffering from a severe bout of asthma in England in July 1969, I spent hours bathrobed in front of the television, watching the coverage of the Apollo 11 mission on the BBC. As Armstrong and Aldrin explored the lunar surface, the pauses in their conversations with Mission Control in Houston seemed to synchronize with the laborious rhythm of my breaths, so that I began to imagine that I was with them on the moon. It was an oxygen-deprived hallucination. Looking at the night sky after Armstrong's step and the flag planting, 
It seemed that the moon belonged to America. This evidence of the power of science convinced me that America was the place to be, not this chilly island with its stifling air supply, but the land that made all things seem possible. And thus, um, the, well, the, the, the greatest American patriot. Um, fungal spores, what else as a cause of asthma? Very important cause of asthma. Here we go, alternaria spores. Their alternaria spores are, are global in their distribution. We're inhaling these spores with every breath. Very important. Spreading. Some of the fungal spores that we inhale can, under some circumstances, particularly when the uh, when our immune systems are damaged, can actually spread from the lungs to other tissues. And so you can see here some fungal hyphae, these filaments, fil fungal filaments that are growing in in uh, in lung tissue here, causing this deep seated, or what's going to go on to become a deep seated infection that can be very very difficult to to treat. In the book, I talk about fungal infections that range all the way from toenail disintegration to some of the foulest um, flesh melting diseases ever pictured in a pathology textbook. And also in the in the book, beyond the, the stories about these infections, um, I look at some recent evidence for um, fungi that are, are almost a constitutive part of our, our, our deep organs and are found throughout the body. And the evidence for this comes from amplifying samples, amplifying fungal DNA from places, from different organs, but even from the brain. So there's a group of mycologists that's um, put forward the idea of an, of, of an active brain microbiome even in healthy brains, so something that's not involved in a in in a, in, a, in a, a damaging infection, but just that these fungi are resident in small numbers, mostly in the form of yeasts in the brain. I talk about the evidence for this in the book. I'm still a little skeptical, but the the, the, the experiments appear to be well done, and there's also some some work on uh, animal brains too, lab animal brains that seem, seem to support this idea. So we're learning more and more about our interaction with all the interactions between the, the body and, uh, and fungi really with every week. This is a research on the microbiome is a very active area of, of inquiry. Let's move here. Oh, and just to point out here that many of these fungi, the ones that are clinically most significant, um, are, are, are opportunists. So they're found growing on, on uh, rotting fruit and vegetables in our, in our kitchens, if we allow that to happen. And uh, this picture here shows um, a fungus called mucor. That's the Latin name for the, for the genus. This is actually one of the first illustrations of the fungi that came from Robert Hooke's um, classic book, Micrographia, um, published in the 1660s on the left there. One of the first images actually of any microorganism. And then on the right from uh, one of my heroes, Anton Michaeli, um, his picture of the same fungus published in the, the 18th century. And these fungi show up, they cause mucormycosis, which I describe in exquisite detail in the book and uh, really horrible interactions with fungi that we all hope that we're going to avoid throughout our, our lives. And fungi, did I have a number there? Like one and a half million deaths every year now caused by fungal infections. And some evidence to show that the number of lethal infections is increasing. Some of that may have have uh, global warming may be playing a, a, some role in that, at least in terms of changing the distribution of these fungi in this country and elsewhere. Let's talk about briefly about digestion. The human gut is filled with bacteria, as we know, trillions of bacteria, but it's also brimming with billions of yeast yeasts, um, including candida yeasts, but other malassezias down there. The dandruff fungus and its relatives are also in the gut. 
So in, in some, if you look at the Wikipedia page on the microbiome, I believe, sort of it, it de-emphasizes the fungi and said that, you know, there's only billions of them rather than trillions of, of bacteria. But what that, uh, that, that uh, uh, elides is the fact that yeasts are giants in the microbial world. And if we look at the total surface area, it's equivalent to the top of an eight person dining room table that's passing through the gut at any time. So this is an immense surface area for interactions between um, the, 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 between these fungi, between this, this chemical interactions between the fungi and the human immune system that's enriched in, in the gut. So extremely important. And it goes some way to perhaps explaining how such tiny organisms, and even though there's only billions rather than trillions, seem to have such a profound effect upon our health. And I talk about, or I discuss a lot of the recent research then on the microbiome and links to all kinds of human, uh, all kinds of illnesses ranging from inflammatory bowel disease all the way to colon cancer. And so I think I discuss, I hope I discuss in, a, in an objective fashion, the, the, the evidence for these, uh, for these links. It's always really difficult to, what, what, what's really difficult in this clinical research is to determine the, the, whether we're dealing with a cause or a consequence. So if we see these changes in the gut yeasts in relation to the development of, of, um, of uh, colon cancer, for example, it's very, very difficult to figure out if that's a consequence of the development of this, this disease or whether it was influential in actually um, that inflammatory response that maybe led to, to the development of cancer. So that's a question that I explore in the book. Let's move on here. Nourishing. So now moving to these th these interactions with the when we can, I, I refer to it as sort of the extended microbiome. These interactions with fungi that go beyond the body. Some of those are um, conscious, and some of those are unconscious. Th think about the way that we use. Uh, cheese, excuse me, fungi to ferment cheese and and uh, uh, preserved meats and so forth. That clearly these these activities began at least without any knowledge of the microorganisms involved in these profound transformations of our our sort of raw materials for our foods. Um, think about this in terms of um, baking bread, brewing beer, uh, making wine, making soy sauce. These are all examples of the way that we interact with with fungi in this more extended sense incidentally this this is a an industry in the united states that represents more than a trillion dollars of activity it's it's more more important to the to our gdp than than uh, the automobile industry at this point it's uh very very significant um on the dinner menu tonight corn i don't know how many of you have actually tried corn but this is a fungal product it's a mycoprotein that's produced by a species have i got a picture of this i do this cause it's it's produced by this filamentous fungus a species of fusarium that's actually grown in these gigantic fermenters these things can be up to what was the figure that i saw here let me just look that up 1500 1,500 tons of corn are produced in these 500 meter tall, uh, uh, they're called airlift fermenters. So it's, it's, uh, it's actually a very energy intensive process, but at least it avoids killing chickens. And as, as, a, as, a, as a chicken farmer of sorts, we keep chickens for their eggs and because we love them and they're uh, more intelligent than many of my colleagues at my university, perhaps. Hopefully none of them are watching this this evening, but we can avoid killing them, these very smart organisms. And instead we can eat corn nuggets. What we eat with chicken nuggets, what, what we're, we're really enjoying is, is the flavor of the, uh, the, the batter and the flavorings on the surface anyway. So um, perhaps as a uh, flexitarian, I've forgotten how good chicken nuggets are, but I, I think uh, uh, corn nuggets are pretty good. 
And where has my slide gone? So mycoprotein, an example of our, our extended relationship with fungi, cultivating these, these, these uh, filamentous fungi in these massive and these gigantic fermenters and a product from the United Kingdom. Treating. Um, so this is Otzi. So he was 44 year old, a 44 year old man when he died in the Otzi Alps and uh, more than 5,000 years ago, discovered by some hikers in the 1990s. And the interesting thing from a mycological perspective about Otzi is that he was carrying some trinkets in a in a in a leather bag that was strung on these these thongs, and these turn out to have been made from the birch polypore, Fomitopsis betulina. So why was the Iceman Otzi the Iceman carrying these? fungal nuggets why had he carved them and strung them on these thongs it was suggested in a paper maybe i'll read this it was suggested by an italian anthropologist in the late 1990s that um Otzi had used these a lot of wishful thinking here He'd used measured doses of the fungus to induce strong, though short-lived bouts of diarrhea to cure himself from a, a worm infection, which I don't think is very likely. Plausible, but, but no evidence for this, wishful thinking. And we often do this in terms of our ideas about the historical uses of fungi um, as a source of, of medicines. So I write about this in the book too. Um, and we do this in a contemporary setting too, in the belief that's held by many, many people that mushrooms are, might be, maybe, you know, profoundly useful in curing or treating our chronic conditions, our chronic Ill illnesses. Um, I wrote an article that was published back in 2016 with the provocative title, Are Mushrooms Medicinal? Question mark. And I continue to get a, a mixture of, of, of fan mail and hate mail um, by email. I don't do anything on social media, thankfully, based on that article, because my conclusion was essential, was, was no, there isn't any evidence for the medicinal effects of these um, mushroom products as I describe in the article. And um, in the book, I bring that up to date. My thinking on this has evolved in some ways, but still the evidence that the, the, the what, taking mushroom powders, mushroom coffee, mushroom tea, eating medicinal mushrooms as they're, they're actually currently sold has any positive effect on human health. That's my strongly held, op held opinion. Justified, as you'll see if you read that chapter in the book. I'm optimistic that in the future, we may find lots of useful medicines by actually studying fungi. So talk about work that's been performed on bird's nest fungi, these beautiful fungi, only a, a um, what less than a centimeter in diameter. They form these splash cups and these capsules that are filled with fungal spores are splashed away from the the uh, the parent fruit fruit body there's been quite a bit of work that's been performed on these serious research on these these fungi um in terms of the antibiotics that they produce and none of these products have actually been commercialized at this point but they're there fungi because they're interacting with other organisms in nature must be producing all manner of different compounds with antimicrobial effects, for example, like antibiotics. Of course, we know this from uh, uh, penicillin and uh, other antibiotics produced by filamentous fungi. Um, so that I think we, we face a rich, that we, we, there is the prospect of this rich future 
of uh, uh, drug discovery using fungi. But in terms of the 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 the, the claims that have been made for magic, uh, excuse me, for uh, medicinal mushrooms, as I state in the book, I'm not getting into this in any detail here. The evidence is lacking. We could talk about lion's mane in the question session, perhaps poisoning. I want to leave some time for questions here. Um, I talk about amatoxins found in in uh, death caps and other members of the genus Ammonita and its associations with witchcraft. I talk about the ergot fungus and um, the, 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 the cases of ergotism uh, reported in, in, uh, in medieval Europe, perhaps in this country later, its relationship to the Salem witch trials. So very important, uh, a whole, whole slew of different. It's a bioweapons center, really. The ergot. This is this, 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 this browny, uh, brown colored uh, uh, structure that's that's purely fungal and it's growing from the the uh, 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 fruit of um, this this cereal plant here. It's particularly rich on 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 uh, rye grass that was a staple food. So I talk about this in, in that chapter. Here we go. We'll look at this, the temptation of St. Anthony. So this is actually after Hieronymus Bosch rather than um, similar paintings by Bosch. And if we look in the bottom part of that figure, there's a number of references here to St. Anthony's fire that was caused by uh, the, the, the mycotoxins in the ergot fungus, you can see that there's a picture that's on the so on the on the bottom here. Whether I whether I whether you can see my arrow there, but there's a picture of a severed foot there that's next to this uh, magician, perhaps. So one of the effects of of the ergot fungus was to cause vasoconstriction, incredible burning sensations, even to the point apparently that limbs were while well, they developed patients developed gangrene victims developed gangrene and then lost their their extremities including feet perhaps we got a burning village in the background there's a number of different things so reference there to saint anthony's fire lots of references then in this uh painting from the 15th century perhaps 16th um to this case of of, of mycotoxin uh, poisoning also, we got dreaming. Um, lots of interest, of course, right now in um, psilocybin and uh, magic mushrooms. Psilocybin, when we consume magic mushrooms, the psilocybin in these these fruit bodies is converted into psilocin, which is a mimic for serotonin. Has these profound effects upon our uh, nervous system and appears to be significantly useful in the treatment of of clinical depression that is unresponsive to some of the uh, other drugs that are prescribed to treat depression uh, useful in treating P ptsd and so we're seeing calls for the legalization of of psilocybin from this uh from got, on the left there we've got psilocybin semilanciata the liberty cap but uh, this this compound is present in mushrooms that can be can be grown in in uh, high quantities in culture, and so we've seen psilocybin legalized in starting in Oregon, but now in other states. I don't know if it's made it to to Delaware yet, but perhaps it will. Um, quick thing to read here. Getting ahead of myself here. No, I'll wait on that. I mean, in the in in, in the book, um, I talk about um, some of the the work that was or enthusiasm for magic mushrooms that developed in the nineteen seventies, and I described the pronouncements of Terence McKenna about alien mushrooms as uh, one of the least enlightening things ever written about fungi. So I looked into that re the, the 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 writings from the 1970s, but I found myself 
intrigued by some of the work i mean you've probably heard about this the mushroom and the cross and the idea that the roots of christianity might lie in mushroom worshiping cults in in europe which is sort of a fascinating idea no clear evidence for this but i'm just going to show you a couple of images here there's been some really interesting scholarship done in this area in recent years um on on wall paintings so this was the famous one in Plancaro chapel in central france um painted probably in the 13th century and it shows the shows adam adam and eve next to the uh tree of knowledge and uh there's a serpent you won't see it very clearly in this picture but there's a, there's a serpent that's wound around this tree of knowledge it appears to be a mushroom tree it doesn't really look like a an umbrella pine which is another possibility and the serpent's handing the forbidden fruit towards eve and what was the artist or the artists what were they trying to convey with this picture with this wall painting let's look at a couple of others saint martin de vic in france early 12th century also a wall painting here it appears to show a monk that's up on the left here that's, that's harvesting mushrooms from some kind of mushroom tree i mean what, what what was this for i don't know the answer to this a mushroom worshiping cult perhaps not i mean there's some of these these suggestions of are, 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 are very unreasonable well this one here this one's really impressive this another abbey in france a painting from the 11th maybe 12th century what are these these structures these fruit bodies at the bottom they certainly look like mushrooms to me could they be something else what was the purpose of the artist in actually um painting what what was the charge there what was the commission i mean clearly these were going to be seen by worshippers maybe mushrooms did have some place some role in the early christian church or certainly in the early the development of monotheistic ideas i discuss this the evidence or lack thereof in the book but it's these are very provocative ideas that i think deserve a second look um, i think it's difficult to discount them all right, I'm um, getting to there. We go, magic mushrooms. This is this is what it's like living inside my mycological mind, a constant mycological wonderland. Anyway, tremendous enthusiasm right now among young people, among my students at my university in magic mushrooms. All right, last last thing to to feature here um recycling is the ultimate extension of our relationship with the fungi we're totally dependent upon or we are dependent upon the activities of the fungi in nature we can look at fungi as decomposers that spin the carbon cycle and there's also the mycorrhizal fungi that uh, sustain earth's botany incredibly important in terrestrial ecology but also increasingly we're finding that fungi are important in marine ecology too. I said something there, a qualifier. I said that mycorrhizal fungi sustaining Earth's botany. And we don't know, of course, whether botany exists anywhere else. But I wanted to bring this to a close with a brief reading here from chapter 10 about extraterrestrial mycology without getting woo-woo. So Kepler, 16, Kepler 1649 is an Earth-sized planet in the constellation of Cygnus, 300 light years from our solar system. With its close orbit to a small star, climate models suggest it is quite Earth-like in temperature. If Kepler 1649 is watery, it seems likely to harbor life. And if it accommodates anything more complicated than our bacteria, it is certain to be populated with fungi. Confidence in this untestable hypothesis is born from understanding the essence of fungi on Earth. Our fungi are the agents of entropy, transforming the energy captured in, to, captured in the web of life into the raw materials for the continuous regeneration of the biosphere. 
without a group of organisms with these properties, the ecosystems of rocky worlds like Kepler-1649 would stall as planetary compost heaps of, un of untappable energy. They must be there. If there's life there, there's got to be something like a fungus growing on Kepler. Totally untestable. So, um, yeah, totally untestable. But fungi, if life exists elsewhere in the universe, the fungi are going to be there, some form of fungi. So this is the story, finishing on time here, this is the story of the fungi near and far. They are everywhere and will outlive us by an eternity. And I end the book with In Myco Spiramis. In fungi we trust. So thank you for um, staying with me for the last, I don't know, half an hour or so. I've been keep looking. I've been distracted by this. We, we, this is awful storm coming towards us. So that's been distracting me. But hopefully I, I've said a few cogent things about the fungi. And here we go. Mycorrhizal fungi. What have we got here? I'll end with this couple of photographs I took with my iPhone that um, whenever I, I think about... Uh, studying something other than fungi i'm brought back to the significance of of mycology i took this photograph um in fiji some years ago cell phone photograph of a sunrise and then in the next picture it was all revealed to me the significance of the fungi in mycospiramis so thank you so much and if we We've got a way of of um, having a discussion here or, or addressing some questions. I'm I'm more than happy to to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mani. It was a fascinating talk. We do have a lot of questions. I will uh, read them to you. Okay. Uh, I had a few pages of my own after reading your book, but I don't have to use them. So we're going to start with uh, a very simple one. One of our Listeners, Skip Halpern says, as a layman, I would appreciate a definition of fungi. How do they differ from other microbes? How do they differ? Well, they're far more interesting than other microbes. That's the most important thing uh, to note about their definition. But the fungi, so they're eukaryotes. They that they, they their cells are like our cells. They're complicated things with a nucleus. So the the the, the chromosomes of a fungus stuffed inside a nucleus just like our chromosomes so they're eukaryotic microorganisms but more significantly probably in a functional sense they're not photosynthetic so they don't make their own food like fungi and photosynthetic bacteria but rather they feed on on biological debris materials produced by other organisms and they also form these uh, mutually supportive relationships with with other organisms, but they're feeding on the things produced by other organisms. Is that a definition? They're eukaryotic microorganisms that feed by absorption. That's the sort of mini textbook definition. Very good. So there's a couple of questions when you were discussing the potential medical benefits of fungi. We had a few questions. Um, is there any evidence that uh, anything has been derived from fungi that might help fight cancer or viral or bacterial infections? So the, the this is it's a complicated and it's a controversial ish issue. There are many many studies that have been performed that purport to show some useful effect of 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 what fungal extracts on some very serious illnesses, including. Um, including different forms of cancer. If we if we carry out a, a a very objective review of those studies, only a few of them actually seem to be at all useful. There have been a few studies, so probably the best things in the area of cancer biology would be the use of um, what uh, beta glucans. These are these are compounds that are found within the, the cell walls of fungi. And so there's lots of these in, in mushrooms like shiitake, all mushrooms, really. 
There have been some studies that show that they can actually increase the lifespan of patients that are suffering from a, a terminal illness with, so for example, advanced stomach cancer. Uh, the evidence though really suggests that what's happening here is that these compounds act as adjuvants. So they actually, um, if th th they might, for example, um, what? improve the outcome of patients that are taking other drugs, other standard chemotherapeutic agents, that the fungi actually seem to perhaps increase the absorption of these compounds into the, from the gut into the bloodstream. And so we see an increase in the life. There've only been a couple of studies that have shown this, but they increase the lifespan of patients um, compared with controls. So that's that's really as far as it goes. There's, there's, of course, a rich history of the use of, of medicinal mushrooms in the treatment of cancer, but, but the, the, the evidence right now is, is, is really lacking that these mushroom extracts have this, this effect. And yet, because they market it as food products rather than medicines, you know, the FDA doesn't really control this, and so all kinds of claims can be made about the the usefulness of these medicinal mushroom products in treating our, our illnesses. But I'm telling you from a scientific perspective, it's very, very limited. Um, we could talk about lion's mane, which is interesting. So this is being marketed right now as a, as a, as a treatment for, for Alzheimer's disease or to, to sort of ward off the development of the cognitive decline. Yeah, you know, the evidence for this is, 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 is almost non-existent. But there have been very interesting studies that have been performed on cell cultures, cultured nerve cells that seem to show that these the compounds from lion's mane will increase the growth of nerve cells or increase their connectivity. But that's that's a there's a huge there's, there's a long way to go from those kinds of lab experiments to showing that actually consuming powdered lion's mane or drinking it in coffee is going to save us from um Alzheimer's disease. You have uh, comments in your book about the potential nutritional value of eating mushrooms, but I think you're very careful to say that there doesn't appear to be any, but they still taste good. Yeah, I think we eat them for their, we should eat them for their texture and, and for some of them for their for their great flavors. But I um, mean, a lot of claims again are made about nutritional value of mushrooms. They've got the caloric, they, they pound for pound. Now there are exceptions, but store-bought mushrooms, um, pound for pound, I mean, they've got the same calorific value, same energy value as a lettuce. I mean, they're mostly water. Um, yeah, they've got some fiber. They've, they've certainly contained some useful minerals, but you know, far less than you get by eating a banana. So I'm, I'm not going to claim that these are of, of tremendous nutritional value. There, there's some exceptions. Um, what about the common view that you hear that if you find some mold on bread or cheese, you should either throw it out or excise it? Well, on the surface of cheese, I mean, I, I mean, the, obviously the soft cheeses, many soft cheeses, camembert and, and uh, brie and so forth have actually got a fungal crust on the surface. That's part of the, well, at least texture wise, that's part of why we, we, we enjoy those cheeses. Um, the, 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 probably the best rule is, so if you've been cheese is expensive, you can slice off the, uh, if, if something looks particularly moldy and unpleasant, unappetizing to you, you can slice that off and the fungus isn't penetrating very far into the, to the milk product. Moldy bread's another matter. I don't think it's going to harm you, but, uh, it's probably quite unappetizing for, for most of us to eat moldy bread and, uh. So yeah, idea. Throw out the slices on either side and eat the stuff in the middle that hasn't become moldy yet. But uh, yeah, uh, this is a great threat to our health. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a question from uh, Lori Fulton. Uh, she she says my Mexican friend made me some soup with a hutacochi fungi that grows on corn, which is considered a delicacy. She says she ate it. I'm still alive. Reportedly, the Mexicans have been eating this for millennia. Do you have any thoughts about this uh, habit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are farmers that that actually deliberately cultivate. It's a plant pathogen. It's something that 
that actually um, you know attacks uh, attacks corn, but they'll grow it deliberately, and it is indeed a delicacy. You can actually buy it in uh, canned form in 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 delicatessens or you know uh, Mexican um, uh, uh, grocery stores in 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 the lower 48 and it's it's not as good as the the, the fresh stuff apparently but uh, yeah some people love it sort of got it got, i mean i have eaten it it's got a slightly grainy texture at least as i've eaten it. it looks looks like cooking chocolate so it looks very appetizing i think <laughs> um back to finding um the ice man with uh fungi uh, would you comment that he also uh, apparently in his uh, his little carrying case uh, carried some mushrooms, which he used not for nutrition, but for uh, a very important purpose, right? Starting a fire? That, that's been suggested. Yeah, um, that, 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 that it might have been as a fire lighter. But, um, you know, again, and you can't prove that, right? <laughs> none of this is known. We don't know why he car carried this. And we actually see, I mean, that that, um, that birch birch conks or other other related fungi carried on thongs. We see see this as a um, it appears to have been a, a religious practice among some of the Plains Indians that that they held some kind of that, that they held had some kind of spiritual value for the people that carried them. So maybe that's why Otzi was carrying these things too, rather than for some practical purpose. Uh, you you also talk about another uh, ancient Austrian who was found in a mine that had uh, a dated age of 2,600 years ago. And apparently he had uh, traces of Roquefort and beer. So he had a pretty good diet, huh? 2,600 well, years ago. Dried, yeah, it was, it was dried fecal samples found, found in this, this cave. And so, but by amplifying the DNA from those, those, uh, those samples, um, if you get a pretty good idea of his about his diet, and in, indeed he was uh, he was he was an ancient gourmand. He was eating blue cheese and probably drinking beer. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, in the beginning of your book, uh, you mentioned that you became a mycologist because you suffered from asthma and probably still do it at some rate and you play pay homage to two heroes of yours i wonder if you would talk about uh dr john floyer and roger altuyen as why they're heroes for you yeah. so um, actually just uh, the the Asthma didn't make me a mycologist. It's more, it's more just one of those serendipitous events that, you know, my childhood was absolutely affected by inhaling fungal spores. And then I end up studying them for, for, you know, during my career and the way that these spores are actually aerosolized. So, yeah, there's there's some irony there. But I do indeed in the chapter about, about breathing, I talk about, I mean, Roger Altoonan, for example, was um, uh, uh a very important clinical or, or very um, yeah important clinical researcher, at least from the perspective of, of, of an asthmatic, that he actually tested lots of different different drugs on his own asthma attacks. He was a severe se severely asthmatic, and so he'd inhale these dusts and induce an asthma attack, and then try these different products to see which ones actually might um alleviate the the effects of his asthma and he, he had an emergency medicine that he had to use by probably stabbing it into his leg to bring him back i mean he's an absolute hero for anybody that suffered from asthma it's it's almost inconceivable that someone would put them through this and then we see this rich history of of other investigators that have sort of tested the effects of fungi on themselves i mean we talk about, about this uh so so people that have researchers in the past have deliberately infected themselves with fungi and then looked at the effects. I mean, it's, it's amazing. This self-experimentation that um, I'm sure it's outlawed. It probably was outlawed then, but anyway, they certainly learned a lot from, from these experiments and yeah, fascinating. Uh, another section of your book, you mentioned talks about 
our inside, our digestive system, which you characterize as either a well-oiled machine or a melodious trash compactor. And it, as we know, depending on how we treat ourselves or what we eat, it can go back and forth. Absolutely. Um, what, what can you say based on all your studies of how, what's the best thing we can do to promote a healthy uh, gut relationship with all the, this biomic material? Well, one thing is not not to take antibiotics, which is, which is a problem. The antibiotics actually change the whole of our intestinal, the the, the, the microflora. So it's it's microbiome, microbiome, which includes the fungi. So it's actually destroying bacteria in the gut and changing the balance of things. And so it's anything this we call it dysbiosis. If we're upsetting the the sort of natural um, uh, relationships between fungi and bacteria in the gut. So in, in terms of, of actually supporting a healthy gut microbiome and microbiome, I mean, the, the, the having a diet that is, is certainly uh, emphasizes plants seems to be significant. Having a diet that emphasizes some diversity, different foods, foods that are actually, so rather than eating chicken nuggets every day, that's, that's a death knell for, for anyone. And, uh, so yeah, diversity, I think, is the, I mean, that's look at our dentition. We're we evolved as omnivores, but uh yeah. So let's uh do uh, have one more question. Uh with all your studies of fungi, uh, what's your favorite mushroom for eating or cooking? Mm, that's that's a good question. So probably probably, I mean, I actually I'm not that much of a fan of 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 wild mushrooms which which is which is is, is perverse isn't it but um i like porcini mm -hmm. so um so the uh, king boli it's got different names called porcini in italy and you can buy dried porcini in in, in bags in in again good good, good delicatessens um and uh, that's a wonderful thing to add to all kinds of dishes because it adds such a, a a woodsy smoky flavor to stews and uh, uh and and soups i think that's probably is my favorite favorite mushroom but i've actually never eaten it uh eaten it as a as a fresh collected mushroom but it, it certainly retains some interesting flavors in a dried form well i'm sure we uh, many of us have our favorite mushroom and uh you can learn more about this fascinating topic by buying the book courtesy of Princeton University Press, which just came out. And please get it from our, our co-sponsor, uh, Browse About Books. And you can even get a signed copy from Professor Money. Um, I think I'm going to turn it over to um, Rebecca so we can thank you. And before I do that, I want to remind you that um, roughly a month from today on... Uh, It'll be May 7th to be our last uh, talk in the science series for the semester. And we have Professor uh, Christopher Heckscher, who is a local at uh, Delaware State University, who will be talking about why we don't see as many fireflies as we used to. However, there are three new kinds of fireflies he found in the Nanakote Reservation. So he wasn't even looking for him and found him. It's an interesting story that was written about in the Smithsonian. And we found him and got him to talk to us. So we're looking forward to that talk. Hope to see you back then. And Professor, one person, one of the comments was, this has been fungi. <laughs> so I just wanted to pass that on to you. <laughs> Excellent. That's, uh, yeah. Rebecca, <laughs> we'll turn it over to you for the applause line. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. And Dr. Money, I hope you get home before the storm hits. Uh, so we're not going to keep you much longer. So folks, if you want to um, unmute yourselves and applaud and sit, very quickly say thank you so we can get him on his way. Thank you. So, thank, thank, you. You. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Really interesting. Thanks all so right. much. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. thank you all for joining thank us, you. and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Good night. Bye-bye. Yeah, so all right. Bye.